In this lecture, we'll talk about organizational structure, and in particular, the forms of organizing that we have. This is still a generic kind of description, not specific to functions, but more just how we can, if you look at an organization, um, what it looks like and how we, one can think about what's going on and how authority is structured in the organization. Along with assigning various tasks in an organization, one of the things management is responsible for is to desi decide on how the authority in the organization will be structured. Of course, as we talked about before, the span of management and the uh, layers of management are part of that plan, but more specifically, you want to think about how one designs the authority relationships between what's happening in the field and on the ground and the decision making that occurs. How these authority relationships will play out and be structured across the various things the organization is doing. It doesn't have to be one structure. In many cases, it can have hybrids about what's going on. Uh, common forms that we'll talk about in some coming slides include a line structure. Line meaning there's a direct line from management all the way to the people that are doing performing the tasks. Just one straight direct line. A line in staff which has some additional functions that help support the process. Multi-divisional structures which operate individual units as, uh, as sort of semi-autonomous but at the same time they report into a larger structure. And lastly, we'll talk about a matrix structure, which has, uh, which which looks at how uh, how best to operate projects at the same time as consolidating and building expertise in various functions and competencies. How you build projects, do projects that require multiple competencies, but still build the and take advantage of synergies across the competencies. Um, you have to consider what structure to do, and typically. Those are uh, put in an organizational chart. So we'll talk about uh, some various forms of structure uh, in this lecture. The simplest structure is the line structure. You can see this little figure here on the bottom. It goes right from the owner to the hourly employee through the manager and the assistant manager and the floor manager and whoever else. Um, this direct line from, from the top to the bottom. This is This, this is the simplest. Uh, organization. It has a clear chain of command and enables managers to make decisions quickly. A mid-level manager facing a decision only has to consult one person, his or her immediate supervisor. That supervisor then only has to consult one person, his or her immediate supervisor. However, this structure requires managers to possess a whole range of knowledge and skills because each one is only one person, so they have to be the one that has that uh, responsibility or that, uh, that authority. They're responsible for many, many, many activities and must be knowledgeable about them all, which as organizations become more complex and bigger, that becomes harder for one individual to, uh, to control. So line structures are common or most common um, in small businesses. And those of you that have worked in small businesses probably recognize this where you report to the manager who reports to the boss or whatever. Um, but this is only one type of structure. It's, this is, it's really modifications to a line structure that the other structures are as the problems of dealing with organizational life become more complex. The next structure to think about is the line and staff structure. Uh, in this scenario, when certain when a when an organization grows to a certain size, you want to build centers of expertise, if you will, centers of excellence. Um, you'll have things like uh, relationships between superiors and subordinates, but you'll also have these specialized expert expert areas, managers, or there might even be groups that report to a manager. And these are called staff managers. Um, these, these people are there to, and their organizations are there to assist, assist line managers in certain specialized tasks, like HR or engineering, something like that. Line managers then focus on their area of expertise operating the business, while staff managers provide advice and support to the line departments on specialized matters. I mentioned some of them, but you can think of finance and law, engineering, human resources, accounting, that sort of thing. 
However, line and staff organizations also can experience problems because sometimes they get overstaffed. There are sometimes ambiguous lines of communication, even of authority or responsibility for certain tasks. It can become diffused. You're losing that direct line, and now maybe not only do I have to talk to my boss, I have to talk to HR, I have to talk to accounting, you know, all of those kinds of things occur. So sometimes employees can be frustrated that they have the lack of authority to carry out their their day-to-day -day tasks. This chart shows a, a figure of this uh, line and staff structure. Um, locally, it's pretty much what you will find, even if you're in one of the larger structures we're going to talk about in a minute. Your work life is generally is oftentimes like this. You have people that you work with doing your jobs, but there's also departments you have to get specialized input from, like like your technology department or your uh, your HR department or your tax department, that kind of thing. So you're here in this case, you can see there's a, there's a direct line relationship between the plant manager and the production manager, who then has a bunch of supervisors that all have employees reporting to them. Those are all the line structures. You can flow that back up to the top. But you also see the dotted lines between the production manager and human resources. The production manager, when it's time to do compensation, uh, there are policies that the human resources group is developing. If somebody wants to do a hiring, they have to follow the policies that the HR group brings in. So there's this dotted line relationship as well that is uh, why the staff both is helpful because it provides all that expertise to the production manager. They don't have to have it themselves, but it also can cause some frustration in terms of decision making. Uh, many organizations you work in, will, you'll, this will, you'll recognize this kind of structure as your sort of local work environment, the plant manager being your, your boss's boss or something like that. But there's groups in there that you have to deal with. So be, uh, be thinking about that as how organizations work. When organizations get larger, sometimes they form uh, what's called a multi-divisional structure. Uh, it's, they, uh, these traditional line structures start to break up into groups uh, to perform uh, particular functions. Um, it's difficult to coordinate communication when the organization starts getting bigger, so you kind of chunk it up a little bit. Um, the weakness of this structure, of course, is that different divisions start to have uh, turf wars or you have things happening in silos, as they say. and or the HR group starts to want more power than the, than the line group, and you have different kinds of uh, divisions that start to have, uh, have challenges occurring. Um, existing benefits uh, to this is that you might have, um, they, they might decide that they're trying to build their particular uh, process up, and uh, it's at odds with perhaps how things are currently being done. And so implementing change through this kind of structure can be quite difficult. These departments become can become larger groups called divisions. Um, and these, just as de departments might be formed, they also might be formed geographically. So you might have a geographic divisions that, um, that work together. Um, they might produce various products or whatever. Uh, there can also be situations where this, the decision making authority is delegated into the divisions, um, and that causes decisions to be being occurring that are not necessarily in sync across the various divisions and in the various departments. The divisional structure sometimes creates uh, work uh, duplication. In fact, you could argue that it's hard to avoid uh, duplication of work whenever you have, for example, the easiest one to think about is regional ones. You have a western region, an eastern region. They both have an HR function. Um, different laws are focusing in locally, so those HR functions could build up the same expertise in two different locations in the company, and those could actually come into conflict. Uh, that's why it's harder to get economies of scale once you break up into divisional structures but the benefits are that you have more information for decision making closer to where the decisions have to be taken. So as you're starting to see, probably all of these have their trade-offs. There's good things about them as you add all these other structural aspects to it. It brings in some efficiencies, but it also creates potentially some other problems. So one of the lessons from this discussion is as a manager, 
you don't just take the organization structure that's presented with you. Of course, you work with that a bit, but you also have to be thinking about, is it the right one for the current situation? As things change, you might want to move and change your organizational structure to some degree. The last structure we'll talk about is a matrix structure, which is an important one when, when there's lots of different kinds of projects that require similar types of expertise along the value chain. Um, for example, you might uh, want to have different kinds of uh, development projects in a real estate business. You're developing a, one particular community over here and in another location on a different timeline. You're developing a community um, that has a uh, that has uh, may, maybe it's got higher prices or whatever. So those are two projects. Both of them require architects and engineers, uh, implementers, purchasers, planners, you know, those sorts of things. So you have those different groups that are in administrative units, your engineering and, and architecture and, um, and line groups that are doing the actual work, but they're divided and they're put into specific projects um, to, to work on that, pro that process. That's why the matrix structure is often called um, the project management structure is set up teams from all the departments and they operate on specific projects from beginning until end. So if you think about it, there's two intersecting lines of authority. Let's take a look at a, a graphic that describes that a little bit. You can see that here you have uh, each project is in the rows coming down on the left side and then you have somebody who's a general manager or project manager of that and then you go across to the different functional managers in each of the areas and then each project underneath those functional areas has people from each of those functional areas on each of the projects so there's two bosses and typically those people that in that situation your review is by your functional manager but the project manager provides the input uh, that for the specific tasks and so therefore your given basically your your um, appraisal or evaluation on an annual basis, your raise is based upon how well you performed on the various projects, but as mediated by your functional manager. So that's a, it creates a little more compl complexity, but it actually also creates learning and, no, and you're not limited to one type of input. You get input from your project manager feedback to improve your, your performance, but you also get it from your functional manager to improve your performance vis-a-vis -vis other people doing your specific function. So that's a discussion of how organizations can be structured, kind of like the world you live in in an organization. Um, in the next lecture, we'll talk about the actual groups that you're working in and how those groups function and what's, what's, uh, what life in groups and teams is like and how you can think about that as you go into a work environment. That'll be in our next lecture.